Peter Brimlow, you're here talking about neo-socialism and electing a new people. Can you tell me what is neo-socialism? Well, you know, socialism is classically defined as the public ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. But neo-socialism is the public control of the, of the uh, means of production, distribution, and exchange. Uh, you know, it's done, <coughs> excuse me, through regulation and law of one type or another, but politics is still in command. That's really the central uh, development, the central truth uh, that's emerged after the collapse of socialism, after the collapse of the, so the Soviet Union and the discrediting of direct um, state ownership of the economy. Uh, but to, amazingly, you know, the left didn't go away. It just changed its rationale. Its, inter inter its interventionism used to be uh, driven, uh, rationalised by efficiency, that they're going to make the economy more efficient, but now there's going to be more equitable, it's equity argument rather than efficiency argument. Typically it's things like, you know, uh, promoting gender diversity or preventing discrimination or protecting the environment, all things which they believe aren't taken care of in a, in a free market economy. What's the social basis for it? Oh, well, you know, if you look at, um, if you chart uh, the government share of the GDP, the gross domestic product, the uh, output of the economy, over like 150 years, you find that about uh, 1900 it was about 4 or 5% of GDP. And even as late as the Second World War, it was less than 10%. But then it soared. So now the government's spending like 40% of GDP. And that uh, spending is, is, is done by somebody. There's a whole army of, of uh, what we call the new class, people who make their living off the government in various ways. Not necessarily directly employed by the government, but, but involved in programs that the government has forced upon the economy, such as, for example, uh, affirmative action offices in, in, in corporations and so on. Or to a large extent, colleges, the enormous growth of government-funded colleges. There's an awful lot of people who directly and indirectly make the money from the government and through, the, through politics, basically because of political power. And they need, they, they, uh, neo-socialism really is a rationale for what they do. Uh, they believe that they're, they're transforming society and uh, advancing society uh, through, the, through the exercise of government power uh, for which they're paid handsomely. Would you say the acceptance of neo-socialism will increase or decrease in the coming years? That's a very good question. Uh, it's more insidious than, than the old-fashioned form of socialism because I don't see that it, it contained within itself the seeds of its own destruction in the way that socialism did. I mean, it was always obvious intellectually that socialism wouldn't work. It took 60 years for people to find this out. I mean, von Mises made this argument back in the 1920s with the so-called socialist calculation problem. You, it, because they don't have a price system, they can't make the economy work rationally. Uh, but it took about 60 years before people uh, realized this was the case and the Soviet Union collapsed. I I'm not sure that's the case with neo-socialism. It's a much more insidious thing. It's because it doesn't interfere with the economy as directly. Uh, you know, it may, I'm not sure it has the seeds of its own, own destruction in it. On the other hand, it, it is gradually eliminating political freedom, so there could be an explosion coming there. By explosion, you mean violence? No, well, I mean, the first instance, political uh, uh, turbulence and possibly secession, and that kind of thing. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's not that easy to force people who are very different by nature to live together. And, and that's really what government policy is doing right now. I mean, immigration, for example, is one aspect of this. They're bringing in people who are very, very different from Americans and telling them not to assimilate. And, and that imposes enormous cost on, on native-born Americans. And that's why, for example, Americans, generally speaking, are leaving California at such a tremendous rate at the moment. Uh, uh, it, it will ultimately cause tremendous politi political turbulence. What do you mean by electing a new people? Well, th that's uh, derived from the famous poem that the German communist poet Bertolt Brecht, he was a distant communist in East Germany, uh, he wrote it in, in 1953 after the East German risings against the Soviet occupation. And he said that uh, um, uh, maybe the, the, the government should dissolve the people and elect a new one uh, because the, the people weren't behaving properly according to what the Communist Party thought they ought to be doing. 
Uh, now, that's literally what uh, the governments throughout the Western world are now doing. Uh, they've set about dissolving the peoples and electing new ones uh, by bringing in vast numbers of people from uh, very different communities of the third world and so on. And it's very closely tied up with neo-socialism because what it does is it creates problems which the government is then called in or feels called in uh, to, uh, to resolve. Uh, it has to intermediate, it has to have all kinds of race relations laws and anti-hate crime laws and all this kind of thing because of the friction that is important to the community. So from the point of view of the government, it's great, these people are clients. Uh, but from the point of view of the people, it's catastrophic because uh, they've been displaced. What would you say to the person that says all of this fancy talk is just a, a cover for a deep-seated racism? Uh, I would say, uh, I have a number of answers to that. The famous answer that Trudeau girl gave, you know, was, uh, I would say that mad. Uh, you better cut that out, haven't you? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I'd say that uh, it, it, racism seems to me it has to imply prejudice. Whereas what's going on here is that I think white Americans generally uh, implicitly and without being fully aware of it, and you see this in the Tea Parties, are organizing themselves because they feel under attack uh, uh, by, by current policy. Uh, they're obviously not motivated by hate, uh, or uh, so to that extent it's not racism, but it is racial in the sense that they feel themselves to be very different from the government right now. And of course the government, uh, the, the Mark Barr administration, is a minority occupation government. It does not have deep ethnic roots in, uh, in, uh, in the deep roots in, in the country. I mean, 45% of the vote cast in, uh, in, 19, in 2006 uh, was cast by white Protestants. But 45% of the Obama administration is definitely not white, white Protestant. There's not very white Protestants at all there. So they, they have this real gap between the government and the, and the government, and, and uh, they're naturally going to organize against that. So uh, it's not racism, but it probably is racial in some way. And uh, what's wrong with that? It's okay for... You know, Zionism is okay for Jews, and, and black nationalism is okay for blacks, and La Raza is okay for the Hispanics, and eventually because of this tremendous diversity that's been introduced into the community by public policy, whites are going to start warning about their own interests too. Would you consider the white response to be an organic response? Organic in the sense of, of natural, uh, yes. yes, I think it's just inevitable, it's inexorable. They've been presented with a situation which has taken them some time to figure out, but they will eventually start to... Uh, to organize themselves in terms of their own interests. How could they not? <laughs>